word will read from Leviticus chapter 24, uh, verses 10 through 16. And then we'll turn over to the Gospel of Mark. Uh, We'll read there chapter 14, verses 60 through 64. So beginning in Leviticus 24, uh, we'll read verses 10 through 16. Uh, Before we do that, let's pray and ask the Lord to bless our time now as we read and consider His Word. Let's pray. O Lord, as we come now and hear from You, we ask, O Lord, that Your Word would be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. As we go about this world living in a world of sin and misery, we need Your truth to guide us and to teach us and to form us and shape us so that we can honor You, so that we can love our neighbor. Father, reveal to us Your will tonight. Conform our thoughts, our deeds, and our words according to what is revealed to us tonight in Your Word. Give us eyes to see and hearts to believe the wonderful promises and commandments that You have given to us in this Word. For the glory of Your name, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Leviticus 24, beginning in verse 10. Now an Israelite woman's son, whose father was an Egyptian, went out among the people of Israel. And the Israelite woman's son and a man of Israel fought in the camp. And the Israelite woman's son blasphemed the name and cursed. Then they brought him to Moses. His mother's name was Shelomith, the daughter of Debri of the tribe of Dan. And they put him in custody till the will of the Lord should be clear to them. And then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Bring out of the camp the one who cursed. And let all who heard him lay their hands on his head. And let all the congregation stone him. And speak to the people of Israel, saying, Whoever curses his God shall bear his sin. Whoever blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall stone him the sojourner as well as the native, when he blasphemes the name, shall be put to death. Mark 14, uh, beginning of verse 60. Uh, The context here is Jesus uh, before um, the high priest and the Sanhedrin um, the last uh, night uh, before His death on the cross. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, Have you no answer to make? What is, it that these men, uh, what is it that these men testify against you? But he remained silent and made no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his garment and said, What further witness do we need? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death. You may be seated. Well, this evening we began by singing from Psalm 8, our opening song of praise. And in Psalm 8, the the very first verse and the very last verse are are the same. David begins this psalm with the same phrase. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is Your name in all the earth. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is Your name in all the earth. God's name is majestic, uh, glorious, magnificent, we could say. Because that's who God is in Himself. right? He is magnificent, glorious, majestic. He is the source of all goodness, truth, beauty, majesty comes from Him. And so we see then that God's name reflects His character, who He is. And then if we then have contempt 
or disdain for God's name, then we are really having contempt and disdain for God Himself. It is a serious matter with how we speak and how we use the name of the majestic God because His name is majestic in all the earth. And so here tonight we consider the third commandment. That we are not to take the name of the Lord our God in vain because He will not hold them guiltless who takes His name in vain. God is concerned with the proper use of His name. Right? God's name can be spoken in, the, in a right way. But there's also a wrong way to, to, in which God's name can be used. But it kind of begs the question, why is God so concerned with His name? <laughs> why is this such a big deal about uh, His name? Well, boys and girls, let's just think about it uh, in, your own, in your own house. If your brother or sister, right, uh, for, the, for the first part of the morning, continually and knowingly called you by a, a wrong name, right? maybe after the first like, few minutes, you'd probably get really annoyed. Right? And you'd say, that's not my name. Right? You're not getting my name right. <laughs> We'd be really annoyed with our brother and sister if they continued to call us by the wrong name. Right? We don't like it when people call us by the wrong name. And that's why your pastors work so hard at remembering all your names. And we're thankful that Church Social helps us uh, in that pursuit. But not only do we not like it when people use the, our, the wrong name, but sometimes people might make a, a pun or use our name as a joke, right? And that can feel like they're speaking bad about our, ourselves, of us. It doesn't feel good. And so we try to be very careful, right, with how we speak other people's names. And if we're careful with how we speak uh, the names of our fellow image bearers, how much more so should we be careful with how we speak and use the name of God Himself? And so what we see here is that the third commandment is that we as image bearers must use God's name properly. We must use God's name properly. Properly. And notice that God states the third commandment um, in the negative, right? He tells us what we're not to do. You shall not take my name in vain. God's name may not be used in vain or in a meaningless or flippant way. God does not want us to empty his name of meaning or to use it in a careless or a wicked way. When we consider then the proper use of God's name, it really tells us that there's two things, and we see this in actually all of the Ten Commandments. There's two ways in which we can properly use God's name. Right? We see what is forbidden for how we use God's name. What is forbidden in how we use and speak God's name. Right? That's the wrong way to use God's name. But we also see what is required. What's the right way to use God's name? To speak God's name. So those are our two points for this evening. What is forbidden by the third commandment and what is required by the third commandment. So firstly tonight, what is forbidden by the third commandment? This is probably um, easiest for us to understand, right? Because it, that's how the commandment is stated again, right? In the negative, don't take God's name in vain. And that's how answer 99 uh, helps us understand by giving us a list, right, of these specific sins that are forbidden. Notice it says, we should neither blaspheme nor misuse the name of God by cursing, perjury, unnecessary oaths, nor share in such horrible sins by being silent bystanders. But notice at the beginning, um, there's this kind of big word uh, that the, the catechism uses to describe the sin that is forbidden by the third commandment. Right? Blasphemy. Blaspheme. Blasphemy, we can say, is uh, to attribute to God something that uh, is opposed to His nature and will. Blasphemy is to attribute to God something that is opposed to His nature and His will. I went back a few years ago and read some of my old seminary papers. And you, right, we, we learn a lot about God over the years. You go back and read some of those old papers and you're just like, wow, 
this, is, this got me a pretty decent grade. That's kind of amazing. All right? we, we continue to learn more and more about God. And sometimes we can blaspheme about God just by being ignorant, right? Of, of being ignorant of who He is and not knowing, being careful by understanding who God is. But blasphemy can also be much more intentional. We have wrong information or we, we believe um, uh, false things about who God is. Things that are contrary to the teaching of His Word. But blasphemy, as we see here in Leviticus 24, it also has its root in just a kind of general irreverence for who God is and for His Word. This man, who we're not given his name, we're only given the name of his mother. We're told that he's, um, his father was an Egyptian. Um, he's living amongst Israel. We only know him as Shelomith's son. And notice here this, this, this half-Israelite, this half-Egyptian. He's involved in a civil disagreement of some sort, right? He's in some sort of a fight or conflict with his neighbor. And during the fight, whether out of anger um, frustration or just from a general irreverence. Maybe even because he's half Egyptian. We don't know. But notice what we read in verse 11, right? The Israelite woman's son blasphemed the name and cursed. You can almost picture the scene in your mind, right? These two men uh, fighting over something. We're not, we're not told what. And then this, this half Egyptian, half Israelite's this curse, this blaspheme comes out of his mouth. And everyone kind of just goes silent, right? The whole room goes silent. Did he just say that? Did he really just say that? And notice how, how uh, Moses describes this incident, right? It doesn't say he blasphemed God, but just blasphemed the name. Right? We know whose name it is. <laughs> And the ESV gives us the name here in, in, in all caps, telling us that this is clearly God's name. God is so identified with His name that when it's spoken, it's the name. He has the name. Everyone knows whose name has been misused and blasphemed. He blasphemed the name that is He blasphemed God who is known by His name only. So this is very clearly a violation of the, the, the third commandment. Taking the Lord's name in vain. And remember, right? What is, what's the second part of the third commandment? God says, I will not hold him guiltless who takes my name in vain. And that's exactly what we see happening to this man after his blasphemy. His violation of the third commandment results in a just punishment. Bring out, Jesus, or the Lord says, bring out of the camp the one who cursed, and let all who heard him lay their hands on him, and let all the congregation stone him. God goes on to say, this is not just the curse for this man, but for anyone who blasphemes, right? Verse 15. And speak to the people of Israel, saying, Whoever curses his God shall bear his sin. Punishment for blasphemy. Whether they're a sojourner, like, this, like probably this man was, or they're a native born, when he blasphemes the name, he shall be put to death. Well, to many of us, that might sound rather harsh. Unfair. Unjust. But by misusing God's name in anger or, or irreverence, this man is saying to God and to the world, I don't care about you. I want to be the master of my life. My world, you mean very little to me. I don't want you to be my Lord and my God. If we understand the relationship between Israel and God as a king to his people, these are really words of treason. I don't want you to be my king. I want to rule my own life. 
And as we say in, in answer 100, yes, this sin is so bad. No sin is greater or provokes God's wrath more than blaspheming His name. That is why He commanded it to be punished with death. And the Catechism goes on and tells us some specific, specific examples of, of blasphemy, perjury, unnecessary oaths, um, sharing in such horrible sins by being silent bystanders. Isn't that relevant for us? We also hear of it in question 102 where, we talk, where the Catechism speaks about uh, swearing oaths by saints or other created things. That, that is not legitimate for us. But we're not going to look at all those tonight. Really what we want to see here is this, this general uh, for, uh, prohibition, we could say, against blasphemy. God forbids a rash and inconsiderate use of His name. Well, if that's what's forbidden of us, what's required of us? What are we to do? How, how can we properly use God's name? We might be tempted to conclude that maybe the better part of wisdom should say, well, if we can use God's name in a wrong way, let's just not say it at all. Right? Let's just, let's just cut it out and we'll just put in, put in something else instead of saying God's name. That way we'll be safe. Right? That's exactly what the Jews did. When they read the Old Testament, they do not read the divine name, Yahweh. They, they substitute it and read Adonai instead because that's their way of avoiding saying, of breaking the third commandment. Is this, a, is this how we should avoid? Is, a, is this how we can properly use God's name by just, let's just not say it? No. Right? I think that's just going to lead us down into more legalism, more things that are... Uh, that are not uh, forbidden for us in God's Word. And it's really amazing, right? It's the, and the Catechism tells us here, in its wisdom, it doesn't give us a list of things we can and can't say. Right? Notice the second half of answer 99. What should we do? Well, in summary, we must use the holy name of God only with reverence and awe so that we may properly confess Him call upon Him, and praise Him in everything we do and say. There's a lot of wisdom here in the Catechism. Right? Not to give us a list of things we can and can't do, but it gives us these categories of how we use God's name. Two words, reverence and awe. Reverence. Right? Maybe we can think of reverence as how we act when we're in, a, we're, in a, we're in a place or in the presence of somebody important. Somebody who has a lot of power or authority maybe. I think of when, uh, when we used to visit uh, Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. Right? It would be very irreverent, right? If you walked around there blasting your, your music or your, iP or your iPod or something to that effect. Or kids running around being, uh, treating it like a playground, right? This is a place of reverence. To remember the men who sacrificed. A similar way, we are to be come before God and to use His name with reverence because He is the true and the living God. Well, what's awe? Well, awe might be right when we, when we are in the presence of something that is truly beautiful, uh, glorious, as, as right, David said, majestic. Right? When we first behold um, the mountains or a sunset. And that is awe, right? It lifts us out of ourselves by the wonder of it and it puts us in the presence of things that are greater than we are. Awe lifts us out of ourselves by wonder being in the presence of things that are greater than we are. And right before God, we stand then, brothers and sisters, with reverence, or we should with reverence and awe. And that's the same way that we should use His name. It's not only an attitude, but a heart that is filled with reverence and awe that can properly and rightly use and speak God's name. And the Catechism does give us actually one, uh, one clear example of how we can uh, speak God's name with reverence and awe. And it tells us that in question 101. 
that we can swear an oath, we can take a vow in God's name. We can do that and we take vows, right? When, when do we see people take vows in our society? Usually at marriages. We also see in our context, we take vows when we become members of the church, right? Those are all legitimate ways when we take those vows in God's name. Those are, those are uh, ways we use God's name with reverence and with awe. And again, the Catechism also tells us that we can use God's name with reverence and awe when we properly confess His name. Right? This is speaking to, to knowing God properly, right doctrine. Right? Boys and girls, we're beginning a, whole, a new season of catechism and Sunday school. This is so you, that you can properly confess God's name, so you can rightly know who He is. But notice the catechism goes on and says that we can properly call upon Him. When do we call upon God? We pray. And finally, we praise Him in everything we do and say. Right worship. So right doctrine, right prayer, right worship. That is how we properly use God's name with reverence and with awe. Well, brothers and sisters, as we come to a conclusion this evening, as we sang in our song of preparation, right? Psalm 175. That the law reveals our sin. And the proper way for us to understand the third commandment is that we have to be honest that, brothers and sisters, at one time, we have all at one time or another, either with the words that we speak or with the thoughts of our minds, or by being silent bystanders, as the Catechism says, we have all blasphemed God's name. We have all tried to rob God of the glory that was due to His name. We wanted to have the glory. We wanted to have the reverence. We wanted people to revere and remember us instead of Him. And so we all, like this half-Egyptian, Shelomith's son, we all deserve that punishment, that curse. But loved ones, in His boundless mercy, God sent His Son to endure that curse that all of our blasphemes and all of our sins and all of our curses of God's name deserved. He endured the curse and the punishment that all of our blasphemy deserved, brothers and sisters. And notice what we read about Jesus here in Mark 14. Jesus, as He confesses uh, this, this beautiful confession, right? the high priest asks Him, are you the Christ? Are you the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus says, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. The high priest tore His garments and said, what further witness do we need? You have heard His what? Blasphemy. Jesus is falsely accused of this sin of blasphemy, of breaking the third commandment, of doing what the third commandment forbids us to do. And therefore, Jesus deserves the same sentence as Shelomith's son. You have all heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death. Jesus' false accusation of committing blasphemy will ultimately lead to his crucifixion. But we know, brothers and sisters, that the Lord Jesus Christ was the sinless and spotless Lamb of God. This confession is not blasphemy because it is truly who this man, God the Son incarnate, was and who He will be in His resurrection and in His ascension. Lord Jesus Christ never took the name of His Father in vain. And as the sinless One, He bore, He endured the punishment and the curse for all the times that we have used God's name in vain. 
for all the times that we have stood by silently while our friends and family cursed God's name. For all the times we spoke God's name rashly without a care. Jesus died for all of those sins and the punishment that we deserve. But boys and girls, remember, right? God's Son has a name too. Do you remember what the name Jesus means? It means Yahweh saves. Yahweh, the name that the Jews would not speak. Jesus embodies that promise that He is Yahweh, the Lord, who saves sinners who blaspheme His Father's name. God saves. Jesus' name testifies to His mission to save us from all the times that we have taken His name in vain. He takes the just punishment for all of our blasphemy. And Jesus' name is glorious. His name is majestic. And so we can say and we can sing, Lord, Our Lord Jesus Christ, how majestic is Your name in all the earth. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father, You are holy, righteous, just. And as creatures, we bow before, your rever- before You with reverence and with awe. And as creatures and as sinful creatures, we have so many times in our minds and our thoughts and in our words have used Your name rashly and uses it and taken it in vain. Father, forgive us. But Your Word not only reveals to us that we deserve the curse and punishment of death because of this great sin against Your holiness and righteousness, but Your Word declares to us the Gospel that Your Son, whom You gave the name Jesus to. He would embody the promise that You save sinners who call on Your name. And that as our Savior, He bears the punishment of death. He bears the curse of death. That every time we have blasphemed Your name and every time we will blaspheme Your name, that Christ bore that punishment. Christ took the curse. Father, in Christ, may we go out from this place and use Your name properly with reverence, with awe, that we might rightly know You, that we might rightly call upon You, that we might rightly praise and worship Your name until You call us home or until Jesus comes again. Father, we ask this all in His name. Amen.